Let's take a look at the history and techniques of traditional animation. Animation is a form of motion picture that's made by hand. And that's different from a live action motion picture that involves a camera that's shooting a real scene. Animation is made by hand. Live action is, in a way, a documentation of an event in the real world. It may surprise you to hear that the first animation was created over 2,000 years ago. The earliest known description of animation was a rotating lamp from China in the first century. The inventor, Ding Huan, created a lamp with fans inside, so that a rising column of air caused a cylinder to rotate. On the cylinder were translucent panels painted with images. As the cylinder turned, the images changed, creating the illusion of motion. And this is essentially the same principle as the zoetrope. Motion pictures and animation work on the principle of the phi phenomenon. And that is, when you show a bunch of still images in quick succession, the brain interprets that as a single moving image. This principle became the basis for many parlor devices and theatrical entertainments in the 19th century, such as the zoetrope and other similar devices. Animation has its artistic roots in visual art and theater. On the visual art side, of course, drawing is the basis of all animation. If you're like me, the first animation you ever made was a flipbook in the margins of your textbook at school. The flipbook was officially patented in England in the mid-19th century. The theatrical side of animation is one that may not be as obvious. Character animation in particular relies upon acting. In fact, there's an old cliche that says, Animators are just actors who don't want to get up in front of people. Here's an example of a theatrical presentation of animation in the late 19th century. Charles Emile Reno was a real rock star of animation. He improved on the zoetrope by adding mirrors, and he called that the praxinoscope. Then he developed a method whereby the animated images could be projected on a screen, and he called that the optical theater. Here we see him at work. He's spinning these discs around, and each one of those discs is controlling a different character's movements. Today, we would call that technique animated sprites. You see that in game design. Renault employed stock characters and stories from the Commedia dell'arte because that's what the 19th century audience was familiar with. On the left, we have Columbine, the love interest. In the center is the hero of the story, Piero, or the sad clown, also known as Pagliacci. And on the right, you'll see Harlequin, another clown who always ends up getting the girl because you can see he's a much snappier dresser. Renault's usage of the characters and situations from the Commedia dell'arte are a good example of how new media usually adopt the conventions of older media, at least to start with. In the first two decades of the 20th century, several cartoonists around the world became the first animators. Emile Cole was a French caricaturist who created one of the first animated films, and this was called Phantasmagoria in 1908, and it was really just a stick figure animation. Another important animator of that time was Corino Cristiani, who was an Argentine animator, but sadly, all of his work has been lost. The name Windsor McKay is most closely associated with early animation. McKay was an American cartoonist, he had a popular strip called Little Nemo in Slumberland. And in 1911, he brought Nemo to life. And a lot of people consider this to be the first animated short film. But as we've seen, there were others before this. In the 1920s, the art of animation really blossomed. And we saw the first big studios opening up, such as Disney, Warner Brothers, and Flesher Studios. Here's a still from the famous Steamboat Willie by Walt Disney and of iWorks. It was very popular at the time, and it was also one of the first animated short films to use sync sound. As cartoons were developing in the commercial film industry, at the same time, animation was being used by more avant-garde artists. One of the greatest examples of early animated film is The Adventures of Prince Ahmed by Lottie Reininger. This is a feature-length film created in 1926 using only cut-out silhouettes. This is now the earliest surviving animated feature film, and it's available on DVD, so that's really required viewing for all students of animation. 
Other artists tried their hand at animation, such as the cubist Fernand Leger from his famous short film Ballet Mécanique of 1924. In continental Europe in the 1920s, we saw the development of an abstract form of animation that's sometimes known as visual music. An early example of visual music or abstract animation is Symphony Diagonale by Viking Egling. Egling was a Swedish artist associated with the Dada movement. These abstract films were also known as absolute animation, and they were the forerunners of what we call motion graphics today. Oscar Fischinger was a German artist who created some of the most striking examples of visual music or absolute animation. And this is a still from Allegretto, which was completed in 1943, but he took a very long time to complete it. A three-minute animation synchronized precisely to music using only abstract forms. Fischinger is now sort of regarded as the grandfather of the art of motion graphics. During the Great Depression, commercial animation really took off, and this is now known as the golden age of animation. The art form of animation really reached its peak in 1937 with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Now let's look at some of the various methods whereby animation is created. The most basic technique is called the pencil test. You simply draw lots of images and shoot them one frame at a time. Here's an example from Little Nemo. And there's a mechanism here to register the drawings so that they're all lined up. Today, of course, we would use an animation pegboard to do that. 2D stop motion is similar to a pencil test, except you don't have lots of drawings, you just have a single surface that you keep erasing and drawing over with each frame. And this is an early example of 2D stop motion animation from 1906. A more controlled and repeatable form of stop motion uses articulated cutouts. And The Adventures of Prince Ahmed is, of course, a prime example of that. Reiniger's method was to create silhouettes by cutting out these opaque shapes and lighting them from below. Other artists have created cutout animations that were fully rendered. In other words, you can take a drawing or an engraving or some other image, cut it out, connect it together with pins to articulate it, light it from above, and get the illusion of a moving drawing or moving painting. And many artists have employed this, including, for example, Lawrence Jordan and Harry Smith. For commercial production, the most common form of animation is called cell animation. Cell is short for celluloid, and celluloid is a transparent sheet that can be painted upon. Usually characters are painted on the celluloid and backgrounds are on some opaque medium like paper. Here's an illustration of an animation stand patented by Walt Disney. In this illustration, we see transparent cells on a pegboard and those are overlaid on top of a piece of opaque artwork, and the camera shoots down onto both of those elements. The background art can be shifted from side to side and perhaps up and down to give a greater range of camera movement. Well, the next level up from that is a multi-plane camera where you can get the illusion of 3D by having many, many layers of animation artwork. The multi-plane camera was, in fact, originally developed by Lottie Reininger for Adventures of Prince Ahmed but it was patented by Walt Disney in 1936. To streamline the process of animation, Max Flescher invented a technique called rotoscoping, and that's simply just tracing over live-action film that was shot with a real camera. Here's an illustration of Max Flescher's patent application for a rotoscope projector. What you see here is a projector that's shining into a sheet of frosted glass and then celluloid is placed over the top of that so that the artist can trace the image that was shot with the live-action camera. And this is a method whereby you can achieve greater realism, especially for human figures. And it was used most famously for Gulliver's Travels, and also Disney Studios used it exactly once for the figure of Snow White herself. A more advanced method for combining live-action and animation is called the Aerial Image Camera. And basically, it works with a synchronized projector and camera. 
And as each frame of the pre-shot film is projected onto the animation stand, another camera can re-photograph that image. So you can not only rotoscope, but you can also combine live action with drawn animation. Of all the forms of traditional animation, perhaps the most time-consuming and certainly the most realistic is 3D stop motion. And in 3D stop motion, you've got physical objects, usually models, that you pose and animate on each frame. An early form of 3D stop motion is replacement animation. The idea is that you will have multiple versions of an object, like a character's head, and on each frame of the film, you'll simply replace that head to get a different expression. This method was pioneered by George Powell and his series of cartoons called Puppetoons. Powell, of course, became a feature film director, and his film The War of the Worlds is also a landmark event in visual effects. Replacement animation is still in use today. These are just a few of the heads of Jack Skellington from The Nightmare Before Christmas. Nowadays, replacement animation is actually enjoying a bit of a resurgence because we now have 3D printing technologies where we could, for example, create all of Jack Skellington's heads inside the computer and then print them out to a physical object instead of having to carve each one by hand. Replacement animation has limitations for articulated characters. The limbs of a character and things like fingers and so on are not easily animated with replacement animation. For that, you want a poseable character, something that has an armature. And this method of character modeling with poseable armatures was pioneered by an artist named Willis O'Brien. O'Brien famously created a film called The Lost World that sort of demonstrated this technique. And it was brought to full maturity for King Kong of 1933, in which multiple animated stop-motion characters were brought to life. And this really opened the doors to a lot of visual effects, because now we could basically create any creature that we wanted to on the screen using stop-motion. One of O'Brien's protégés is named Ray Harryhausen. And Harryhausen is perhaps the most famous name in stop-motion today because for decades he created special effects for films such as Jason and the Argonauts. This is a complex shot in which he had to animate each one of these little skeletons by hand, and he was only able to complete maybe a second of animation per day. One limitation of traditional stop motion is its lack of motion blur. A traditional stop motion animation exhibits a weird strobing effect, in which no matter how fast an object appears to be moving, it doesn't blur. It's always in perfect focus. For a real object, either shot with a real camera or seen directly with the eye, a fast-moving object is going to look a little bit blurry. So to achieve that in stop motion requires a more advanced technology, and that's known as Go Motion. Go Motion was developed at Lucasfilm for The Empire Strikes Back. And the idea is that instead of shooting a static model one frame at a time, when you shoot one frame, the model is actually in motion during that one frame. And this is achieved through an animatronic rig. And you'll see here Phil Tippett, a famous stop motion animator, working on this Tauntaun rig. And the Tauntaun moves actually according to a system of wires and rods that are driving its movement. So that under computer control, the model can actually be in motion while the camera shutter is open. Go Motion is an advanced technology that is employed simply to give that much more realism to an animated character. Without Go Motion, there's a very clear difference between live action footage and an animated stop motion figure. And if they're combined in the same shot, then the stop motion looks fake. So, Go Motion is a way of achieving greater realism. And Go Motion probably achieved its peak with the movie Dragon Slayer. And you see the crew here posing with the dragon rig. In the animation industry, a lot of the techniques we've seen here have been replaced by computer animation because it's just simply faster, cheaper, and easier to produce. However, some artists are still working in traditional techniques. For example, Tim Burton's Frankenweenie came out in 2012. 
I'll conclude this discussion of traditional animation with a recommendation. This is Blood Tea and Red String by Christian Sagavsky, a short feature film made all by one person. And if you're a fan of surrealist animation in the vein of Jan Schwankmeyer or their brothers Quay, then this is highly recommended.